Hi, good morning and welcome to this week's edition of Encompass Live. I am your host, Krista Porter, here at the Nebraska Library Commission. Encompass Live is the Commission's weekly webinar series where we cover a variety of topics that may be of interest to libraries. We broadcast the show live every Wednesday morning at 10 a.m. Central Time, but if you're unable to join us on Wednesdays, that's fine. We do record the show as we are doing today, and it will be available on our website for you to watch later at your convenience. And I'll show you at the end of today's show where you can access all of our recordings. Both the live show and the recordings are free and open to anyone to watch. So please share with your friends, family, neighbors, colleagues, uh, anyone you think might be interested in any of the topics we have on the show. Uh, for those of you who uh, might not be from Nebraska, the Nebraska Library Commission is the state agency for libraries, so similar to your state library. So we provide services to all types of libraries in the state, so we will have shows on Encompass Live for all types of libraries. Uh, public, academic, K-12, corrections, museums, archives, uh, really our only criteria is something to do with libraries. Uh, we sometimes have library commission staff come on the show to talk about services and programs and things we do through here but we bring guest speakers on from all across the country sometimes. And that's what we have this morning. With us is uh, Kendra Morgan. Good morning, Kendra. Morning. And she is the program director at Web Junction. Um, Web Junction is a great resource that I've been using probably since it started up, which we'll probably mention that later. <laughs> we will, we will. <laughs> Yep. Um, and here at the Library Commission, we actually support Web Junction. We do provide, um, we are one of the um, sponsors, I don't know what exactly you call us. Cooperative support. We call it State Library Cooperative Support. Mm -hmm. Yep. So we provide some funding to keep Web Junction going. And um, about once a year, on average, we have Kendra come on to talk about what's going on with Web Junction, keep people up to date on anything new, changes, milestones, etc. So uh, I'll just hand it over to you, Kendra, tell us all about what's going on with Web Junction now. Thank you so much, Krista. It's great to be here. Um, we're really looking forward to sharing some information with everybody about how Web Junction can be part of your professional development, your continuing education activities. Um, this is a, a really great opportunity for us to be able to connect with the library community. Uh, we appreciate being invited and, and the work that Krista and the team do to make Encompass available. So thank you. So we're going to do a few things today. One is a quick agenda. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about Web Junction and what we do here. Um, I'll give you a little bit of a tour uh, and talk about our projects. And then I'd love to hear some questions from all of you and hear a little bit about how Web Junction might be able to support your local needs. Yeah, if you do have any questions, um, comments, thoughts throughout the show, everyone, type into the questions section of your GoToWebinar interface. I'm monitoring that and I can grab any of your questions or comments you have for Kendra. Wonderful. Thanks so much. All right. So Web Junction is a free and online learning network that connects library staff uh, to the people, the skills and ideas that help libraries to adapt, lead and thrive. And we really do this by offering free professional development for everyone. Um, and we are able to do this with the support of state libraries. We receive cooperative support from 34 state libraries. We also design and develop grant funded programs that help to keep the resources available for free. We also work with uh, folks who are looking to develop and deliver continuing education as part of a local initiative or part of a federal grant um, or a local grant. And they use Web Junction as their platform in order to be able to do that. Um, and we do this. Um, as an opportunity to make sure that we are scaling and learning and innovation. So for us, scaling means making it as available to as many people as possible so that we can take an idea that is sometimes local and help give it national reach. Um, or we can take things that really have common needs across mostly the library community. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about how we've also expanded some of our resources to archives and museums. And, and make that available through Web Junction. Our primary audience is public libraries that makes up about 70% of the users on Web Junction, but we do see school library staff, uh, 
academic library staff and some archives and museums because there are some commonalities between our cultural heritage institutions and the types of services that we need to provide. So Web Junction became available in 2003, which means that we are celebrating our 20th anniversary this year. Um, and in this time, we have been able to serve over 215,000 library staff through our services, which is really just, um, it's something I'm really proud of and appreciative of the team here and the investment that OCLC has made over the years. So we are part of OCLC uh, and part of our membership and research division here and part of our goal with the membership and research division is to make sure we're connecting the library field to the latest information that might help them do their jobs more effectively and uh, looking into research that we can conduct that will serve the community and also delivering uh, training opportunities for the, for the library community in order to meet those goals. So today we have a really robust and well-utilized service that reaches library staff really around the globe, um, primarily in English-speaking countries. Um, throughout this discussion, I'm going to share a few uh, quotes from folks from our most recent experience survey. So every two years, we ask people to um, share their thoughts on Web Junction, where we can improve um, what's working for them um, and where we can do better. So the first quote that I wanted to share with you um, was from someone who is a supervisor. And they say they have a ton of trainings at their fingertips through Web Junction and are able to use and discuss this with new staff. Our library doesn't have a training department, so this makes a huge impact here. And that's really important for us, right? We want to be able to help libraries of all sizes, but we know that some of the smallest libraries really do have issues with being able to have access to training, both that's from that's Sorry. absolutely, yeah. Um, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, that they don't always have someone on staff who's dedicated to doing training and they often rely on the state library as a really strong resource to be able to tap into. And Web Junction is there as well as an opportunity for people to take training at a time that works for them, that works for their schedule and doesn't cost them any money, right? That they can access quality resources at any time. So we're going to take a quick little tour um, of what you can find when you're on the Web Junction site. Um, you start at webjunction.org. That's our, uh, our home page, our landing page. It's where you'll be able to access all of the resources um, for the site. And you'll find that we have um, some navigation tab up at the top, um, topic areas, projects, the webinar calendar. I'm going to take a closer look at all of these items. We do feature a new story about every week. And these stories I'll talk about a little bit more. And you can think of them as news articles or um, stories from library staff. And this is a place where we would really invite you to bring your expertise to the website because we really like being able to share and amplify the successes that libraries have had, where they found challenges, and how they were able to overcome them. So these articles, and this is a really good example um, that uh, Nicholas Brown from Prince George's County Memorial Library System contributed an article last year on launching successful multilingual programs at your library. Um, when we feature guests, there are a couple of ways that you can do this. One is if you've written an article, and sometimes you, know, you may have written it for your state newsletter or for your library's newsletter, um, we can usually repurpose that and help share that content through Web Junction. Um, we also do interviews with library staff. So when people reach out, or we get connected to folks um, who have done a particular program or offered a service, um, we can actually do an interview and then turn that into an article. And this is not, um, I, I usually say it's not investigative journalism. You know, we really give people a chance to review and uh, make any updates so that it accurately reflects what's happening at your library with those programs. Um, so please, if you ever have uh, something that you'd like to share, um, don't hesitate to reach out. You can get in touch with Krista and she can let you know how to get in touch with me and I'll also share my email address at the end. Um, 
but it, it is something that we want the library community to be reflected in the content. And I can't tell you how often people really, it resonates with them to hear from frontline staff who are doing these programs, who have had to overcome certain challenges or approach something in their community. Um, being able to hear from people who have done it is one of the most important things that Web Junction does um, for the library community is opening up that space. You'll find that all of these articles, the content that we produce is organized by topic area. You can search Web Junction, so you'll see a search bar in the upper right hand corner, but you can also browse and search by category. So this is also similar to what you'll find in our course catalog when it comes to topics where we've been able to arrange things um, to help connect you to areas that you might be particularly interested in at, a, at any time and place. So you can dive into those topics by using the navigation at the top of the screen. One of our, um, I would say this is probably our marquee work is the webinar calendar. And I know that my colleague Jennifer Peterson is on, uh, is participating today in the webinar and Jennifer leads our webinar program. And this is an opportunity for us to connect again directly with um, frontline staff and subject matter experts uh, in the library community who come to share their experiences in these webinars. Recently, we've done uh, some webinars with subject matter experts who um, have been doing research into low morale in libraries, and how we can overcome that. So that was um, just in the last week, um, earlier this week that Jennifer hosted that webinar. So there are so many opportunities on the webinar calendar. You'll find usually at least uh, one a month, sometimes two. Um, Jennifer always strives to get two on the calendar. And these are uh, topics that we have heard from the library community are top of mind for them in terms of things that they want to be able to talk about, to, um, to learn more about. And in those webinars, you will have the opportunity to um, chat with other participants so you can share your resources. It's something that we really like to encourage uh, is the opportunity to also share your subject matter expertise and your experiences. If you've developed policies, if you've offered a program, you'd be able to put that into the webinar chat. And we also record everything just like Encompass um, and put that into the course catalog so that if you miss it, which we know it can be hard to, to for mm -hmm. your schedule to line up perfectly with the webinar, it's always recorded. So you'll be able to take advantage of it at a future date. So this is from uh, one of the respondents from the experience survey, survey um, and that they appreciate that the presenters and webinars are from various communities and experience. That alone broadens my learning experience far more than any intra-regional training session ever could. And I think this is really the same approach that Krista takes with Encompass is inviting people who are doing the work um, or who have something that they can share with the community and really letting them connect through these webinars. It's been such an amazing evolution in the last 20 years to be able to have this type of software that allows us to connect and to share our experiences without having to be in the same room, the same town, even the same state. Oh yeah, yeah. That is one of the things. One of the goals of of my show here has always been to, um, for learning. Uh, definitely for getting you know, for getting the you know, people to learn about all sorts of things. But for you to see from your colleagues and so to share what they're doing and then to learn from them and, um, yeah, being online like this. Uh, Web Junction's been around longer than Encompass Live, <laughs> um, and doing this. And it's it's just I think it's changed yeah how we do everything it's just so so much so many more resources and so helping people connect make that connection no matter where you are um, and know that you know I'm here in my little town in the middle of the unit you, know, you know Midwest but there's somebody up way up in upstate New York you wouldn't think just as rural as me that has the same issues and now I have someone new I can talk to and I can learn from and it's just really you know I think you feel less alone in the world yeah. <laughs> 
Absolutely, and, and really being able to capitalize on other people's experiences in terms of the, what they've learned and how they've approached things. And I, I love the idea of people being able to do that proactively before there's, you know, if it's an issue or a concern, having some, some tips in their back pocket, as mm -hmm. Jennifer would say, to be able to address those issues. Um, but also, when these recordings are made available, it allows people to get to those resources when they might need them. Um, and to think proactively about what's coming in the future that you can incorporate into the services that you're making available to your community. So all of those webinar recordings, um, including the ones from Web Junction, but we also have um, webinar recordings from Encompass. Um, Info People is another organization in California that does webinars, you know, Wisconsin Library Service. Uh, we have looked for opportunities to pull in some of this content into a single location, which is the Web Junction course catalog. And this is where you will find more than 400 um, self-paced courses and webinar recordings that are available for free um, through the support, again, of OCLC, the state library agencies, the grants that we work on. And there are a range of content types that you'll find in the course catalog. So one are all of the webinar recordings. Um, so anytime, and Jennifer is usually really quick about putting those up by the end of the day so that they're very quickly available. Uh, you'll find a couple of different formats. These are examples of some self-paced courses and you can see on the left hand side, there is a, like a menu and table of contents that you go through and these two courses, one is on doing readers advisory, the other is on shelving with Dewey. And they take about an hour in most cases, these, these types of courses, but we do have others that are designed to take much longer. And I'll talk about some of those in a little bit and how they're structured. Um, What's nice about all of this content, the webinar recordings, the self-paced courses, is once you've completed them, you can get a certificate of completion uh, for doing so through the catalog. Every state works a little bit differently when it comes to continuing education requirements. So you'll have to check with your state to find out if they accept Web Junction certificates. But it is also something that's helpful for being able to keep track of what you have done and when. So you'll be able to access all of that through the catalog. Um, it's available 24 seven. Um, so it is available when you have access to it. We know that, and it's self paced. So when you log off, if you need to come back later, you'll be able to, it'll remember your place and you'll be able to catch up. We help to promote uh, the courses and the webinars and the new content that we've published through our Crossroads newsletter. Uh, and you'll find a link to this on the homepage for Web Junction. Um, we usually send out, we send out two issues a month, um, the first and third Wednesdays, and we feature those new articles, those new learning opportunities, and it really is the best way to keep on top of what's happening. You can also find us on social media. Um, and uh, we share upcoming webinars and new content there as well. So I wanted to recap just a little bit about um, what is available uh, on Web Junction. So you've got those two live webinars every month, um, the self-paced and online courses. And I am going to dive into that a little bit more um, when it comes to some of our projects, because a lot of our project work does include the creation of a self-paced course. Um, those new articles and stories that we publish every week, you'll be able to find them through Crossroads, you'll find us on social media, and we're also looking um, at opportunities to research uh, trends and learning in libraries, and I'll talk uh, a little bit more about some of the research that we've been doing uh, in the library sphere. So I want to talk a little bit about what informs the programming that we do. So I mentioned that we have that experience survey or member survey, and we do ask folks, you know, what's top of mind for you now? What's important? Um, what do you need more of? And where can we improve? Um, so that's one place. We also look to the state library supporters that we work with and ask them about what's important in their states. Um, a lot of times state libraries are thinking about succession planning and libraries leadership um, needs that library staff need to develop to make sure that there's a continuous pipeline of folks who want to serve as 
um, assistant directors, directors, managers even, and they're looking for ways to help promote that. We also ask uh, participants in our webinar programs to provide some feedback and we're able to share that both with the webinar presenters and with our team in terms of looking at what's on the horizon and what we can help um, do more of to help serve the library community. Um, I mentioned that one of our key areas of work is around grants. So we often work um, on grants that are funded by the Institute of Museum and Library Services, which is a federal agency, and they have a competitive grant program. And so we generally apply for a grant every year on a different topic, um, often in partnership with subject matter experts in the fields or partners. Um, so we recently submitted a, a proposal for a project with a state library and we'll learn more about whether or not that's going to move on to funding, but it's something that is um, one of the ways that we're able to develop and create new training to make available. And then we look at some innovations and trends, right? Trying to highlight what libraries are doing that's helping to change their, uh, make, make new resources available to their communities, helping to connect to their communities in different ways. Um, is really important to help highlight so that people look at new ways to do things. Sometimes tried and true is great. <laughs> you know, like we don't want to get away from that, but when there are evolutions um, and ways that we can connect with, uh, with the field in or with the communities in different ways, I think one that, you know, that always comes to mind to me now is how libraries adapted during the pandemic to being able to provide curbside service or virtual story times, right? That those things were really important to highlight and provide some people um, with examples that they can tap into. And many of those things libraries have continued doing because they yeah. just became a really good service that people wanted. You know what, this really works for me. Uh, great. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I do love I, that there are things, we've, we've been talking about that a little bit, like when there's a, when there's a push, um, to have to change and then what do we continue to keep and then pull along with us as, as we move through the space. But it is, um, those innovations sometimes are uh, fueled by really challenging situations. All right, now I'm not sure if this next piece is going to work, um, but let's give it a try. So I have a poll because I'd love to hear from all of you about what's most important for training with you and staff in your library. And there's an online poll and you'll have to open up your web browser. And if you go to pollev.com slash OCLC, you'll be able to enter as many um, examples of the types of training that you'd like to see uh, that are important to you, uh, that you know people are asking for, that you know that you are looking for, uh, and we'll see if, if we can get this to work. I'm a little concerned because my, my mouse has been so <laughs> a little cranky today. Yeah, um, I got into it on my screen here. I opened up another tab on my browser, so I Great. got to it. So, um, All right, so trauma-informed service, right? This is a huge issue in libraries and something we've been talking about. And I know the Public Library Association, for example, has a, a, social, a social workers in the library group, and they've been talking about the importance of trauma-informed care and what that means. And it really is approaching things, understanding that people come with a whole series of lived experiences and life that can be traumatic and impact the way that they move through our spaces, which is really important, right? And how we can use that to both engage with our staff, our colleagues, as well as the public cataloging, right? The basics, assigning Dewey Decimal Numbers, Library of Congress classifications, um, public facing staff new to libraries. That's really common, especially in smaller libraries that you have people who didn't necessarily go to library school and they are rocking it and leading their libraries, but sometimes they wanna have a little bit more foundational training in some library skills that might be helpful making LGBTQ programming um, available in the community, how to support the LGBT community, 
and making sure that they have uh, are welcomed in library spaces, that they see materials in the collection that reflect their experiences. Um, so all of these training topics are actually things that you can find in uh, the Web Junction course catalog now. So that's great. Um, so I encourage you to poke around in there and see what's available and how you might be able to use that content. So I want to talk about um, socializing learning, which is something that we've really um, honed in on in the last 15 years about the importance of, of really working together um, for learning. And I really look at webinars as being one of those um, opportunities. So one of the things that we've tried to do over the years is to enhance the learning experience that people have when they participate in Web Junction training, or if we're developing something that uh, trainers might take into the field to do um, based on content that Web Junction has developed. So one of the things that you'll find, um, particularly with the Web Junction webinars that have been out for the past three years or so, um, is the development of a learner guide. And all of the webinars include a web learner guide that's really intended to help extend learning beyond that one hour session. So we've worked with the presenters in those sessions to help explore um, questions that people can ask themselves after the session or take a few additional activities that they can dive into or they can work with colleagues, right? So they can help lead a conversation and have a discussion together about the content that was presented in the, in the session. And that idea of having a, um, a co-learner, a learning circle, a cohort, mm -hmm. um, really kind of connects with helping people to hear some different perspectives on the content, right? What did I hear? What did you hear? Um, how can we use this together? Uh, the idea of being able to, to have a discussion and some of the pressure of doing that is taken off by using the learner guides. We have heard from a lot of folks who will set up like a webinar viewing party where they'll either view the webinar together and then do some follow up discussion or folks will view the webinar independently and then come back and have a follow up discussion that can be led by the learner guide. It can be led uh, by anyone, you know, the content resonated with them and they wanted to dig into some aspects that were relevant to their library. I think what's helpful about that is is really, it makes the hour that you spend in this webinar, it really amplifies uh, that opportunity by uh, taking it beyond that session and making it practical and applicable. There's also an opportunity to integrate learning into our annual learning plans, performance expectations. If you are a manager or a director and you're trying to help people figure out what's their path with their professional career, this is one way to do that by able by being able to pull out some Web Junction courses, other, of course, other providers as well, but helping people to, to use this content in a way that helps them develop their skills. And the next two are really about, you know, how we work together um, to both support learning and encourage it. So, it's remarkably helpful to have an accountability partner, right? Motivating someone else to take the next step, um, setting deadlines around, hey, we're meeting on this day to talk, make sure you watch it and that people come and they feel informed and prepared to have that conversation. And really just knowing that you aren't doing it alone can be helpful with all kinds of things, including learning um, and professional development. And then there's reinforcing the importance of a learning organization. So it, at their core, like really when I think about libraries, it is about connecting the community to lifelong learning, right? It's being able to provide people with the information that helps to make their lives better, more productive, more enjoyable, um, and connecting them with information. And that's no different from the staff at the library, right? That we are part of the community. We don't just work in the library, which is in the community. We are part of those communities. We are also citizens. We are also part of what makes um, the, 
community thrive and knowing that the, growing the library as a learning organization really helps to model the importance of evolving and changing in our communities as well as in ourselves. So to support learning group facilitation, we do have a free resource that can help guide people through topics, any type of topic, quite frankly. Um, it's designed to be customizable. One of the things that we do with these resources is to make sure that they are Word documents um, instead of PDFs so that you can edit them and uh, adapt them to your local needs. And then um, you'll find in that learning, in that learning group facilitation guide, some tips on how to do this work. Most of us don't come with natural facilitation skills, but you can step into it. And I think one of the things that I've learned over the years when I have done this work is that you pretty much just have to be half a step ahead of folks. <laughs> This guide really can help you do that by laying out all the things that you need to do, right? That you yeah, you shouldn't really be that in too intimidated by it. I mean, you, you can do it. It's, it's, yeah, it's, it sounds like a big intimidating. Oh, I don't, I need training to be the facilitator and to run these things. Like, yeah, yeah, you need to be the champion. That's, you know, that's really it. Is that so many of these things that you need to be the champion? And with facilitation, you really are tapping into the expertise in the room right? You aren't necessarily presenting content, but you are encouraging people to talk about it, about resonate, what resonates with them. Um, we have done a general facilitation guide, but you'll also find one that is customized with several of the courses. Um, we have a digital collection stewardship course, um, supercharged story times, and legal reference services have all had uh, topic specific facilitation guides developed and the goal here is really to support that the importance of being a learning organization is that if you don't have a trainer a facilitator but you still want to talk about this content with another person with three other people these guides can help you mm -hmm. it's more like being a host just and yeah. sometimes to just give them the, the, the space in the area and a a guide about what we're going to talk about or what we want to discuss and then let them go to it. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, this idea of a culture of learning is, is really speaks to that last item that I talked about um, and that learning uh, in terms of enhancing our learning is that learning is the business of libraries. It's what we do. Mm -hmm. uh, it's how we connect people. But we can really take these opportunities to motivate each other, motivate ourselves, and model learning, right? That we can be lifelong learners and how it shows up in our work and how we can support our communities, right? We often do projects or programs that are helping people learn um, in order to, to better their lives. And the same thing applies in our libraries and the staff and the skills that we develop. So let's talk a little bit about Web Junction projects because this is where um, we're able to develop a lot of content um, for Web Junction, and uh, they usually these are usually projects that last anywhere from nine months to three years, depending on on the topic and the outcomes. The first one is when I mentioned that one of the things that Web Junction does is research in the library community. And these reports uh, came out in 2019 and 2020 around the opioid crisis and how public libraries are responding to the opioid crisis in their communities. And these were um, based on eight case studies that were done in public libraries around the country and different types of responses that they had in communities of all sizes. So we looked at very small communities all the way up to ones that were serving hundreds of thousands. But what was important was that they were doing something in response to the opioid crisis with a local partner. Um, and that was key to the research that we conducted here was with the topic of the opioid crisis in particular, it is one where subject matter expertise, being able to tap into health departments, um, nonprofits that specialize in an opioid response has really been a way that many libraries have demonstrated the ability to reach more deeply into the community and provide services that maybe they weren't 
familiar with or and sometimes comfortable with, but in working with these partners, they were able to do this successfully. Uh, and what we have done with these stories is to demonstrate how other libraries can do similar work. We are continuing this work and have a, a support kit that will be coming out later this year that will help in um, taking all of the steps and helping people to become more informed about the impact of the opioid crisis, um, understanding the value of partners, uh, even if you are in a very small community who you might be able to engage with um, at the state level, at the national level, if you don't have things locally, and then implementing some of that programming. So this has been a major um, effort that we've been involved in really since 2018 in terms of research and development of tools, webinars, and content. Another area that we've been working in um, has been with the Realm project. And some of you may have been familiar with Realm. Um, it had its origins at the start of the pandemic. And the title really, it originally stood for Reopening Archives, Libraries, and Museums. And it was looking at the impact of having to close our cultural heritage institutions and what was it going to take to reopen them in the face of um, the COVID-19 pandemic? What are some of the implications that are, these organizations were being faced with? Cleaning, masking, um, providing alternative services to the community, um, managing staff expectations. While we've moved out of some of those critical early stage needs, some of the work that surfaced during this project mm. was to identify that archives, libraries, and museums really do have some common ground when it comes to things like crisis communications, um, that our cultural heritage institutions sometimes work very similarly. Um, libraries are often under a local government if you're a public library. If you're an academic library, you're connected to a school. Um, but their structures are often the same. They're often delivering services to the public that need to be uh, uh, tweaked or adjusted um, and changed in order to meet changing needs. So using those commonalities, we just developed and released four courses that came out this month. Um, two are on crisis communications planning and one is on burnout to balance. We talked about how you know, being able to protect ourselves um, and proactively address concerns that may be surfacing from being in a stressful work environment. Um, how do we navigate those situations? And then de-escalation de strategies that libraries, archives, museums, and dealing with the public are sometimes finding themselves in escalated situations where there could be tensions um, with the public, sometimes with, within, between staff, um, and how can we use some strategies to help de-escalate those situations um, and provide consistent service and also um, communicate effectively. So these four courses are now available and you can get to them in the Web Junction course catalog as well as the Realm project page. And you'll see that these are also very self-paced um, courses. You've got that navigation on the left and you can, when you're in the Web Junction course catalog, if you need to step away, you can come back and pick it up at any time. I think what's important with these two is they're about an hour long to do the work, um, but they all have tools and resources that you can use outside of the course. So there's a crisis communications template, um, workbooks that you can use to help um, think about activities. And all four of the courses also have a learner guide available to them. So a group facilitation guide that can be used to help think about how you move forward as an organization. Uh, Kendra, uh, your slides are still on the enhanced learning slide. Did you were you supposed? Did you have one? Were you, did you want to move forward from this one? Yeah. Let's see. I wonder if my screen stopped sharing. Oh, I can still see it, but it's just the, yeah. It, but well, uh, yeah, I don't know. Um, we're just still seeing the enhanced learning slide. All right. Over 
And I don't see anything changed with your connection, so I don't know. I'm going to try and stop sharing it. I was going to say, you try to stop sharing and resharing. Yeah. yeah, that might um, be what needs to be done to fix it. Okay. Are you seeing the slides now? Uh, that's the presenter view. Okay. It's the swap. Uh, Swap screens, yeah. Perfect, there we go. Realm resources right. is what we're seeing now, yep. Mm -hmm. All right. So the other resource with Realm is the Public, Christ Health, Public Health Crisis Management Playbook. And this was very specific, right? We, I doubt in our lifetime that we've seen the end of public health crises and how they're going to impact our cultural heritage institutions. So this playbook is designed to help you do this in a way that's specific to your organization. I think one of the things that we take into um, account whenever we're creating resources is how can it be adaptable to institutions of all sizes so from the very smallest libraries to the largest institutions which pieces do people need in order to be able to deliver in in their community in their institution looks very different right that you can skip sections that you can um, maybe just do two parts of a very long section because that's what's relevant and those are the stakeholders that you're concerned with and that's a really important thing um, to keep in mind whenever you're doing this training is that these are made for your institution, but you also get to choose what parts are relevant. And we're hoping that these can be the guides and the framework that you can need to, to do the work effectively. But you also need to feel comfortable with knowing what your local situation is and that you can adapt these resources to meet those needs. One yeah, the Realm Project did great work. I wanted, to, I just wanted to say that, but through from when the pandemic started, and still what they're doing with their resources in this playbook and everything, I really depended on them for um, getting that information out right away to libraries and archives because you know everyone was at the beginning. I don't know what's going on. Who's going to tell us what to do? And there's lots of information from all different places. And having something that was specific to libraries and archives was such a game changer, I think, to people working in libraries and archives and museums that it's like, oh, this we can focus on. This, this just speaks to what I have to do. I have to figure out, is it safe to check out books that just got checked in? You know, all that kind of thing that we learned, it, you know, was a big deal or not. Um, but then the, when they wrapped it all up with this playbook, it was just like, oh, this can be now used forever. This is great. <laughs> um, well, all the work they did is come up with something really great yeah well if you think about the fact that the people who are leading our institutions today may not be the folks who are there in five ten years if we're faced with another um, opportunity so or another crisis so being able to learn from everything that we've gone through in the past four years and use that in the future to prepare folks who are new to leadership, who are new to their positions and really not have to have them start from zero. Yeah, and it's great that um, that there's also, because some people, this is great, this you know, document to use, but having the workshops and the trainings who have junction for people can learn better that way. That I think is awesome that you all are doing that. Thank you. So one of our most popular courses is Supercharged Storytimes, and this uh, was released um, in 2018 with a grant again from the Institute of Museum and Library Services. And it is such, it is based in research that was done at the University of Washington about how to improve story times in terms of providing skills to children who are looking at early literacy skills, right? We're trying to help build those in, in children. And the skills that are discussed in supercharged story times can help to improve um, the outcomes for those sessions. Um, everyone, we, the tagline that we've had is like, you already provide great story times, supercharge your practice to make them even better. You're, so many libraries are already doing 
this type of work, right, where they're making uh, story times available to children. What you'll learn in Supercharge are just some of the techniques that can help to connect um, early literacy skills uh, in young children. This is one of those uh, courses where you'll find a specific learner guide available for the topic. And we've recently made some updates to reflect newer material that's available um, since the course was initially published. So new resources, new books, uh, new things that you can look at in the field to help further your knowledge. One of our most recent courses is the Digital Collection Stewardship. Uh, and this was also made possible through the Institute of Museum and Library Services and in partnership with Washington State University. And this is to help um, particularly tribal archives, libraries, and museums with digitizing their collections um, and understanding what a digital collection stewardship life cycle looks like, the different steps that you need to take things that you need to understand before starting to digitize a collection. Um, it's really helping to give people that foundational knowledge for creating digital collections. Uh, and this is a seven series course um, that is all freely available. And we're currently working um, on a new course uh, that will come out next year um, to help continue to grow the resources that are available in this collection. And again, this is one of those where you'll find a self-paced learner guide or a facilitator guide that's specific to helping to lead discussions on digital collection stewardship. Um, we're seeing that that's, you know, like at a state level, that's a priority is to help um, institutions with that. So we're trying to make sure that we um, support the state library needs around this as well, um, since it's such a priority and a, a major strategy for, for many state libraries. All right. Well, that is all the content that I'd have, but I'd love to hear um, what questions folks have and, and how, um, how you're using Web Junction, if you are, um, or what we can do to help uh, develop resources that would be uh, valuable to your community. Yes, please do uh, type into the questions section of your GoToWebinar interface. If you have any questions, comments, thoughts, uh, if you have um, used Web Junction before, we'd love to hear about it. Um, as I said, the Library Commission has been um, supporting Web Junction. Uh, I don't know if we've been doing it from the beginning. I, uh, I think in the beginning we had OCLC do it in, in, in the of the Gates grant, correct? Started it up yeah. they, way, way yep. back when. <laughs> yeah, that was the origins, was the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation gave OCLC a grant to make sure that there were some resources available to help with public library com access computers. Um, yeah. And it's, it's gone well beyond. <laughs> yes, and 20 years later, it's still going strong, yeah. which is just amazing. Yeah, congratulations on that, of course. <laughs> Um, so if anyone has used it, please let us know. Um, as, as I said, yeah, this is um, something that the commission supports, of course, along with lots of other states and places. Um, it is something here in Nebraska. You talked about getting um, credit for doing this and how you can use that in your in your states. Uh, we also, on Nankapa Live, you get a certificate for attending here as well, just in case you know you do need something. Depending on who you go to to earn your CE from, your continuing education credits from, sometimes they just you say sure tell us what you did and sometimes they need something physical you can get a little pdf certificate it's um uh, we don't require that here in nebraska but we provide it which is kind of interesting here we know other places people might need it yeah <laughs> um, but here in nebraska you can use all these web junction courses anything you do in there you can submit to earn ce credits for us for our public librarian certification program and our um board certification here in nebraska we have programs where li library staff can earn certification and uh, your library board can certification and this is a place to go to to find things that you can attend and classes you can take and then submit that to us here at the commission and you start earning your hours that you need to keep your earn and keep your certification so highly recommend uh going to it i'm going to have comments come in i've used it i love it great um very user-friendly interface yes that is um I remember when it first uh, started up, I had, I created, had to create an account that I, it was much more, much more to dig into than now. And it's, um, which was, you know, that was what we were doing back then. It was like, it was more like uh, going to class. <laughs> yes. Um, yeah. Yep. All of the course catalog, you will create an account. Um, and I think 
probably the biggest hiccup we have is people not getting their email, you know, to confirm their new account, but we can help you with that. You'll always have access to um, mm -hmm. technical support through OCLC um, to make sure that we can get you connected to all of your resources. So, um, but yeah, that's usually the biggest hiccup. Sounds Spam very common. Filters. Yeah. <laughs> uh -huh. Spam filters, right? Yes, yes. Yeah. Check your junk mail, check your spam. Yeah. <laughs> Your every day you should do that. I've I've missed things. Well, no, I've not missed things. I found things that really should have gone into just my regular email because they're people I do. But you know, technology, just like this morning, sometimes it just decides to say, no, I'm not gonna work correctly today. <laughs> and that's okay. Uh, so does anybody have any questions about using Web Junction or any of this online training? type in the question section. Um, any suggestions for courses, or if you're wondering if they're covering a particular topic? Um, Kendra did do that survey earlier um, where um, a few things um, came up. Something, oh, something that someone is mentioning is uh, um, anything about um, new immigrants coming into my, our country, um, you know, people, you know, uh, refugees, immigrants, that kind of um, specific training It is something that is um, happening in, in lots of areas of the country and all sorts of different um, ethnicities coming from all over the world. <laughs> yep, you'll definitely find some content on that. I think that one of the screenshots that I showed was about you know offering multilingual programs and sure. being able to connect with folks, but you'll also find some webinars on that topic as well in terms of the types of programming people are doing and uh, some of the special needs that may arise when working with immigrant communities and how to engage with them in a way that's yeah, that authentic. was one of, someone else had a question like how do you even find them or get get to figure out where they are and can you know um let them know that the library is there for them and it's a place they can come to and that we're here we're here <laughs> that kind of thing. right because in a lot of places you know a free public library isn't a thing right the types it's of not a concept they know yeah, yeah 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 so being able to work i think a lot of times with there are nonprofits that are uh, working specifically with refugees in the community often a government agency that's helping with um, refugee settlement um, to help people connect with the community are two partners who would definitely be worth looking into and helping to connect folks to library services and even doing, you know, getting someone who is a native speaker to help with um, translation um, and that, you know, the materials are there. And I think that's another area is that if you have a large um, immigrant population, can that help drive decisions about the collection that you have? Can you offer materials in those native languages um, to both help the people, you know, with lifelong learning, right, that they need in their own language, um, but it also creates a more welcoming and safe space for people when they can see themselves reflected in your collection. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There's a place, lots of places, libraries are um, the community center too. So it may help them integrate into the community in general, just having that one little other, you know, a place to go to or something they don't feel so isolated yeah. um, coming to a new town. I mean, that's for anybody, whether you're an immigrant or just moving across country. <laughs> Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. All right, so um, it is a little after 11. I know we started a little after 10 uh, today as well. Um, I don't see any other questions just now, but um, we do have plenty. We'll, we'll wait and see if anyone does have anything you desperately want to want, ask of uh, Kendra about Web Junction or anything. Um, we got some thank yous coming in. I'm going to uh, show my screen here and start working a little bit on my. There it is on my wrap up, but I'm gonna keep an eye on the questions. So um, if you do have any other last minute desperate questions you wanna ask of Kendra or about um, Web Junction, get it into the questions section. We're gonna thank you, Kendra and Krista. You're welcome, Brittany. Um, do you have um, on your slides, do you have your contact info on there or? Um, I don't, I can add it, but it's also Morgan K, M-O-R-G-A-N-K at OCLC.org. Reach out easy. anytime. Yeah. I'll talk in CE, so. Happy to have that conversation with folks. We'd love to hear from the community. If you need to know more about using it or anything, yeah, um, or OCLC support, like you said, if you're having issues. Um, and uh, so uh, slides will be available. You can send them to me whenever you get a chance after this, um, Kendra, or a link to where you have them, whichever works for you. And we'll have them available with the archive. 
Um, this is our uh, main page for today's show, but we do have, I'm going to pop over to our Encompass Live main page. Um, if you uh, use your search engine of choice and just type in Encompass Live, the name of the show, it's the, we are the only thing called that on the internet so far. Wow. Um, <laughs> and uh, you'll find our main page or our archive page. These are upcoming shows for the rest of the year and even getting into January of next year. Um, but our link to our archives is right here at the bottom. This is where today's show will be at the top of the page here, most recent ones at the top. Uh, by the end of the day tomorrow, everyone who attended to today's show or and registered will get an email from me letting you know that it's available. There will be, I don't know if we have that for each of these, but oh yeah, like last week we have a link to the recording. All of our recordings go up on our YouTube channel for our archives and a link for the slides that Kendra will send. You'll have the same thing as this one, which is from last week's show. Um, we also push out this information into our mailing lists here in Nebraska. We have a Facebook page for Encompass Live. If you like to use Facebook, give us a like over there. We do reminders about logging into the show. Here's this one, introducing our presenters, meet the presenters, reminders about different shows. So um, if you like to use Facebook, you can uh, follow us over there. Um, we're also on Twitter still. Um, well, no, we're not on Twitter. I am, and the Library Commission is, but we use the hashtag Encump Live, a little abbreviation for our, our um, show name there and on Instagram to share, to push out um, into social media places as well. You can keep an eye, for, eye on us there. Uh, while we're here on the archive page, I'll show you, um, I'm not gonna sh show this whole page. You can do a search here if you're interested in a particular topic. I'm wondering if you've done something about, if we've done a show about something or had a presenter on or something, you can search through archives. But um, this is our full show archives and this is um, the 15th year of Encompass Live. Oh my gosh. <laughs> And we have all of our show archives here. All of them are up on YouTube. All 700 something, I've lost count. I, I know I looked it up just recently, but um, a lot. Um, and they're all up there. We'll always you know, keep them up there. This is something libraries do, historic, keep things for historical purposes. So as long as we have a place to host them, we'll always be up there. But do pay attention to when you do watch an um, archive show, look at the original broadcast date. Some of the shows will be um, great and stand the test of time and still be useful, but some things will become old and outdated. Resources and services may have changed drastically, might no longer exist anymore. Links might be broken. Uh, people may work at a completely different place than when they brought, when they um, presented for us. Uh, you never know. But um, so just make sure you pay attention to the date of something. It's on every single session when it was originally broadcast. Um, but as I said, we'll always keep them available for as long as. Um, we have a place to keep them. And for as far as CE credits, um, for here, for our live Encompass Live shows, um, in, in about an hour, everyone who attends the live show will automatically get a thank you for attending email with the certificate attached. If you watch a recorded show, you'll have to figure out how you get um, that CE credit. We don't, we can't tell who's watched the recording, so I can't send out a certificate confirming that you did. YouTube doesn't track who watched something. Um, here in Nebraska, you submit a specific form just saying, hey, I watched this archive. If you're elsewhere, you'd have to talk to whoever does your CE, how you can get uh, credit for watching a recording of a previous show. All right. So that wraps it up for all of my end of show stuff. Doesn't look like any other questions. So I think other than we can officially wrap it up. Thank you so much for being here with us, uh, Kendra. This was great. I was glad to get you on the show again. I'm happy to do it. And congratulations on 15 years. That is amazing. The, the number of sessions that you all have done is truly amazing. It's, it's a great it's, testament. Yeah, I took on, I, it was, a, I didn't think it was going to be that hard when I took it on, as that much when I took it on, no, I should say it wasn't hard, but uh, I'm I'm glad I've been able to do it. Like I said, um, getting all this education information out to as many libraries and we're free and open to anything. So we're not just a Nebraska show. Um, getting that learning educates out and being helping libraries share what they're doing too. Um, from the biggest libraries to the littlest libraries, we'll you know have them on the show. So I'm happy we're able to do it. And we've pretty much done every single week ever since we started. Um, the week of our annual conference, we take off our Nebraska Library Association conference because we're all busy with that. Um, we had a few technical issues over the years, um, but almost every single week we've had a show. You'll see a few little breaks here and there, but um, not too bad, yeah. <laughs> well, thanks right. for having me, I appreciate it. Yeah. Have a great day, everybody.
Yeah, so um, that'll wrap it up for today. Uh, next week, you see we do have our shows all scheduled for this year. I hope you all join us next week if you want to sign up for our Pretty Sweet Tech. It is the last Wednesday of the month next week. That means it's Pretty Sweet Tech Day. Um, that's when Amanda Sweet, our technology innovation librarian, always comes on the show to talk about something techie related. And next week, she's got a guest presenter, Cheryl Bayer, who's from Living Pop-Ups. This is um, augmented reality, um, making books into interactive experiences. They're, re they're really cool. <laughs> so um, we'll be, um, Amanda will be on next week to talk um, with her, with Cheryl, to um, tell you all about how that works. So please do sign up for that show or any of our other future episodes we have scheduled here. Uh, thank you, everybody. We'll see you on a future episode on Compass Live. Bye-bye.